also I want to continue because I don't have to stay late and they sat away with you. So let's do it. Okay. Okay? Okay. Is he going to introduce me? Yeah. Okay. Welcome back to 2013 Global Breakthrough Energy Movement. Now, this next speaker has made a great influence in my personal life. He's a good friend of mine, a brilliant artist, and very magnetically inclined experimenter. I'd like to present to you Mr. Josh Toms. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Okay, hello, my name is Josh Toms. I live uh, near Colorado Springs, not too far to drive for me to be here today. Um, very thankful for the great uh, global breakthrough energy movement and for having me. Um, my focus today is going to be a creative energy renaissance. What essentially is behind this, in my view, is the work of Edward Leed Scallon, a man who built a castle in Homestead, Florida. In 1923, he moved it in 1939, and he was born in 1887, died in 1951. His story is really long, and it's deep. It's really hard to really condense what I'm gonna, about to get into in an hour. So, um, is this a little clicker right here? Okay, there we go, and I got a laser. Uh, what is creativity? Creativity is in engineering, creativity is in art, creativity is in architecture. There are so many answers to this question. What is creativity? Energy. What is energy? Energy has the same thing. It has so many different answers. It's life, it's minerals, and it's veg uh, animals, vegetable, and mineral life. All right. Now a renaissance. Uh, renaissance, oh there we go, <laughs> excuse me. Um, it's, it's essentially a cultural rebirth. It's a way to blossom. It's getting to the, the, the blooming of what has been kind of grounded. It's a, there's a good foundation and then you start creating and you start expressing. It's a revival of intelli intellectual artistic achievements and vigor. All right. So geometry. Geometry is all over the place. These are cymatic patterns over here, just a bunch of different frequencies. And over here is a uh, piece of artwork at the Vatican just some geometry and a spiral pattern. I thought it was very interesting when studying Coral Castle and reading his work on magnetic current. What are the two versions? I heard there were like two different versions of magnetic current. Um, the, the book I've been reading is the one that's from their official website or, and uh, the museum. All right, so geometrical connections. I'm trying to express that there's geometry in everything. The gas, the matter, the life, even the 
uh, I mean, the term that we're using for it is like free energy, zero point field. Um, I mean, there's so many different terms for it, but I see us as a reflection of this energetic creative source. So now, where I essentially stem from Coral Castle work is 345 geometry, the Great Pyramid of Giza geometry, mandalas, the, the Pythagorean theorem. It's a very basic equation that can be expressed in so many different ways and it, it's, it's one of the first things we get taught in geometry. So here's a Tibetan mandala, here's some, uh, a template that I drew up. These are just some of the things that I, I'm going to show my artwork here in a little while. Um, everything's really coming from Ed and the geometry of the Great Pyramid. Um, here I have a, a cubed sphere where I take a uh, compass and I essentially just lay different dimensions and I actually cubed a sphere with no straight lines. Um, so here's Ed's symbol. Uh, it's called magnetic current. Uh, the discovery of John DePew uh, has really emphasized how important this is in my life and in nature and experimentation. Uh, the, mag the magic squares, John Searle gets into that and you know it's, it's this calculator, it's this matrix holographic geometric prism. I, it is, they're metaphors what I'm using to try and describe what is going on here and all this. So it's essentially three things. There's three things to magnetism, Ed is saying, what John DePew is saying. There's three things, positive, negative, and the neutral particles of matter. Okay, so the divine template is what John DePew calls it. John DePew has been an inspiration to me. He has shared with me some incredible experiments, some incredible simple, symbolic representations. So this infinity symbol, it's two arcs, just like Ed's little cup, a chalice. This is a Leonardo da Vinci. He's got two different spirals doing two different geometries. I, I'm putting a lot of this up here so maybe you guys will look at it later and get a connection. It's, it's hard to go into the complexities of some of these geometries. It's simplicity trying to it's sim simplicity and complexity. It is like what they were, Jamie was talking about earlier. All right, so. That seems like it's cut off. Okay, well, natural flow. So essentially, where are we going? Uh, we're kind of still wondering where we're going. Our planets are all flying through space. Well, Ed made a little sundial pointed at the North Star. He had a crosshairs and a little pyramid right here. And uh, this is by John DePew. They made this little nice sundial and this thing, when you face it east, you end up getting this kind of grid that ends up showing up. I'll get another picture in a sec. All right, here we go. You got a, a globe showing the progression of the sun and how it moves across the sky. And it's those same arcs that Ed put on his symbol. And what's going on here? Oh, yeah, so that's it. There you go. All right. Here's an experiment John DePew shares on his website. Check this out. So each one of those is a little uh, vortex gear. He calls it the equilibrious grid. These, uh, you can just keep going with this. He's tapping into natural energy flow. He is really making some amazing discoveries in his original work. It is completely original. It's not the best quality video. You can go to magneticspectrum.com and uh, he's got a 15 minute video, high quality. And then here we go. All right, so the flower of life. Let's see, where am I? All right, the flower of life. They're essentially the segmented blueprints of magnetic energy. Um, a sphere is created 
with two arcs to close it. And essentially what he is doing here is he's putting a color spectrum on these arcs, connecting them into these grids. The grids are unlimited in how they can be essentially mapped out. It's kind of how you want to project this geometry upon other geometries. It's a fractal geometrical uh, pro projective imaginative structure. It's, it's, it's very hard to put this into words. So I, I really hope I'm getting somewhere with you guys here. So Coral Castle, he, he ended up building this structure here with the 345 and the, the uh, magnetic current symbol from Coral Castle. So here we go. We got, pi uh, pine uh, shoot. We got pineapples. We got um, so many different plants. Uh, geez, it's so, it's hard to wrap. OK, I'll just get past that. All right, so we've got it in DNA, too. These arcs, when you put them together in such a fashion, it ends up creating the same geometric structure that is, it's all over. The two central pedal, uh, central fugal spins with a central pedal right hand twist. All right, here's another video called Magnetic Warp. This is by Michael Schneider. Uh, never met the guy, but this is an incredible video. Uh, he's got two pieces of glass and a ferrofluid compressed in between, and he's got some LEDs around the outside. And so this is just a magnet here. It's kind of lagging here, guys. All right. Well, if it would stop lagging, you guys can you get that to stop lagging? No. Okay. Well, can you pause it just when it does the little geometry there? It's not responding. All right. Well, it's just showing the different uh, the different spins and geometry in. this thing works. Okay, there we go. It's just, it's a really important video, so I want people to be able to see this. It's just showing that the modern version of magnetism, where they say it's from the north to the south, it is complete bunk these days. It, there are so many experiments, and especially from Coral Castle. If you go into the Coral Castle book and read word for word and do the experiments, you are going to find out that our modern view of magnetism is completely off. So that's just a North Pole, and here's the middle force, these, the straight line. It's essentially connecting everything. This, it's a it's magnetic bonding. This. So here we go. We got the Taj Mahal ceiling over here. If you really look at it, there are the little Ed symbols connecting that. You've got the dream catcher, which is interesting. The, Native Americans seem to have a better understanding on magnetism a few hundred years before our scientists. So here's a really detailed picture of the image Michael Schneider was uh, experimenting with with the viewing film. Some bug eyes and uh, cauliflower. All right, so we've got just so many different architectural achievements around there. Some of these are from Iran. Some of them are from Iraq. I can find these images and these symbolic representations everywhere. So I think that what's essentially going on is that creativity is being expressed either it, 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 we mean to do it or it's bleeding through subconsciously. All right, so the Masonic temples have it there. We've got some uh, temples in Istanbul. Even the violin has the little symbol. This is an old Sumerian. It's got the different spirals. And this is a church from Santa Fe where some guy randomly decided to show up, build this staircase, and left. And nobody really knows how he did it. There's three points of contact, the top, the bottom, and look, Ed symbol right there. So just 
more examples of where mandalas are important. They, they, it's, it's expressing this energy pattern that is pervasive throughout all of existence. The 345 geometry does create all the other platonic solids, but it also has an interdimensional, fractal, harmonic octave. So the music is involved in it it's so big. It's, I'm just using metaphors essentially to try and describe this. It's, it's tough. This one here is really important. It's uh, at Westminster St. Abbey. They pulled up the carpet recently after the, the queen was married, or the, the new princess was married. And uh, this is what they found. And the stones are from all over the world. It's about 1,200 years old. So here we go. We got Ed's wheel here. This is kind of where I'm getting at. Ed somehow built this castle with this wheel. And this wheel is from old Model T Ford parts, the old electrical system. He took it apart, about five of them. This guy was a tinkerer. He took stuff apart and he put it back together. Um, you know, he's using these 15 degree arcs. And I'm just putting a few little images there to give you ideas that it, it is the cardinal directions, these different angles, like when we're using a compass. And that's really what Ed was really talking about, was the geometry of the Earth, the, the geometry of the flux of magnetism. And here we've got some half spheres. Half spheres are very important because it's, like I was saying, it's an arc. This arc geometry, you, you got to be able to define half a sphere before you can get the whole sphere. I, that's my opinion. And this half sphere geometry is expressed in our architecture. So this, this architecture has to be structurally sound or else you're going to have the Capitol building fall down on a bunch of people. This thing's been there since the Civil War. So these, these structural strong foundations is essentially what's going on here. Is it's, it's the arc. Here's some artwork I did on some copper bowls. Um, essentially, I'm taking the geometry of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and I'm laying out these fractal patterns of the ratio of the square root of phi and the 3, 4, 5, and I'm projecting it upon different geometrical structures. So I can actually create these optical illusions with this structure because this structure is depth. It's, it is a measurement tool. This is this is a better measurement tool than when you use a uh, tape measure, because the tape measure is all um, uh, segmented and linear. This is a ratioed nonlinear structure, just like our depth of space is. And here's some more artwork of just the different ways this geometry gets laid out. This is on a pyramid. Um, just some hand-drawn stuff. I really started off as an artist. I started off looking for how energy works. And I looked at all the different names of the free energy movement. I have been in and out of the internet looking at all these different videos. And it's been Ed. Ed has been the one that has stuck with me the longest. And this is all geometry from Ed's work. And here's some black light artwork that I've done. Um, I do every once in a while uh, exposition in Manitou Springs. And I have people put on some chroma depth 3D glasses. And this actually creates an optical separation with the glasses. So I'm applying um, geometry that creates optical illusions with art that creates optical effects. So in person, people really understand what I'm trying to express in my artwork because it is there, it's blatant, and it it is a self-expressive organism. So right here is the pyramid. This pyramid, if you're putting these glasses on and I'm having it sit over in the corner with the right lighting, you're not going to know if it's pointed in concave or pointed out convex. All right, so here are some of my breakthrough energy pieces. This one here, the star, is from John Michael's work. And it's just the showing the spin and the fractal ratios in the pyramid or in the pentagon geometry and the pentagon geometry is actually connected to 
the geometry in the Great Pyramid of Giza. There's, this is what's so important about what Ed is trying to describe and what John DePew is describing is that these, this, this energy is everything. So it's very, it's very simplistic because it does, nature isn't fighting to, to be. It's, it's all here already. Oh, no, let me go back. Okay. All right, this one over here, I have the ohm symbol in there, just symbol, symbolizing the center energy vibration cascading out like when you drop water or uh, drop something into water. But this one here really is the one I just poured myself into. It's called cultural reflections. Now, I put all these different symbols there because each one of these cultures is symbolically expressing this geometry, they're intuitively tapping into what this base energy system, energy source is, the, these three things. And it's, it's just, it's hard to truly describe all of the different layers of how this all came to be, but this structure here is it is one of the things we've been looking for. We've been wanting another platonic solid. They've got computers going out there looking for all these platonic solids, but we, we really haven't looked at the geometry of the Great Pyramid and the, the hologram that it really is. So um, I want to thank John DePew for all of his inspiration. Those are his websites, CoralCastleCode.com and Magnetic Spectrum. This is a piece of artwork he did for the Breakthrough Energy Movement here. And uh, it's in support of me and uh, my friends. And essentially, um, I started a, a movement called the Million Volt March. And it's a way to get all of us to come together and put kind of our differences aside. And you know, this is where I've landed. This is what I really am following, because I do a lot of experiments. I've seen some pretty groundbreaking stuff. But I think what really is going on is a cultural energy renaissance. A cultural energy renaissance is on a multitude of levels. It is, it is gonna change our social structure on so many facets. And I feel that if we have the right intentions, it's going to be a very positive and uplifting future. So um, that, that's my presentation. Um, I tried to sum it up. It's, there's a lot to it. I mean, I really can't do it in an hour. Um, we have time for questions now. What's that? Yes, uh, you can find my artwork. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. That's where I've been essentially connecting with everybody. There's just so much going on. I felt that a, a million volt march, which is actually happening tonight at 10 o'clock here at the Days Inn, we're going to do a big photo op. Um, recently, I was out in uh, Philadelphia with the Tesla Science Foundation. They hosted the event of the million volt march, and we marched in front of Independence Hall um, on Tesla's birthday during the Tesla days, and we we're there fighting for free energy. We were supporting Tesla, honoring Tesla. And that's kind of where I'm going with this. I think we're all going in the right direction. I think we're all going to achieve great things all separately, but also collectively too, because we're all resonating with each other's understandings. We all have a piece of this big pie called life. And I feel that if we can come together and just honor each other and honor our sacrifices like what Tesla did and what Ed did. I mean, Ed worked on that thing for 30 years. The heaviest stone is 32 tons. I mean, that's one-fifth the weight of the Saturn V rocket that took us to the moon 20 years before we went to the moon. So something happened at Coral Castle that we as a society need to embrace and um, uplift the people that have attempted to understand it because um, most, most modern institutions are very naive of this actual occurrence. It's not known. Um, there's a gate there that's a nine ton gate and uh, you can just push it and it 
spins on its own. I was about to say, you know that they finally had to replace the bearing in the 90s? Yep, they had to replace it and get a 20-ton crane to lift it. And they couldn't even get it as flush as it was before, how Ed placed it in the wall. I, you know, I, I actually work with stone day to day. I run CNC uh, cutters down. At, you might have seen my artwork out in the tent. There's an Ed symbol cut out of stone. Uh, we use water jets and different cutting. And I just know how hard it is to do this stuff. And it's, it's coral, too, coral fractures. It chips. And some of the cuts he's been doing is he's using something other than a diamond cutter. Diamond cutter would fracture up a lot of this. Do you have any theories on how he was able to make the cuts and do what obviously was some kind of levitation? Um, I'm in touch with a lot of different researchers on the internet involved with Coral Castle. And the, the interesting thing about the Coral Castle researchers is a lot of them are really they're doing it on their own, and they're, they don't always share it. They're just, they're very reclusive style people, kind of like Ed was. Ed didn't work around people. It's a very bizarre thing. But to your question, I have seen somebody cut a rock with uh, an arc, and that's what they were doing was running a high voltage lead to the stone and cutting it. Um, he's a good friend of mine from Olympia National Forest, uh, Magneticus Attractus on Facebook. Um, about levitation, anybody do any small versions of that yet? I think if we were collectively to come and start embracing John DePew and his work and helping his progress, I feel that we would be able to see that. I, I've been, I, I can't talk about the stuff that he has shared with me, but it is so groundbreaking that I dropped out of electrical engineering school because of what he shared with me. Okay, I, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I mean, I was paying for it and it just, these guys, I met them, total coincidence. Uh, his colleague's name is Jerry Smith. Total uh, coincidence, met these guys at a recycling hardware store. Uh, How long ago? About two years. And if, if we were to just like any of the other researchers out there, if we were able to uplift this researcher to a status where they're not trying to make it day to day, I feel that the Coral Castle mystery would not be so much of a mystery anymore. So is there any questions? about is you've seen um, Marco's work. Have you found where his style of showing things interrelates with what um, Lee's get? Oh, you've seen um, Marco's work, you know, with BBM vortex-based mathematics and all that. Is there an area where it easily correlates to what you're seeing with um, the Coral Castle work? Have you looked at both of them and seen how they make their rodent coils, et cetera, et cetera. I and mean, you see where the geometries seemingly, maybe it's a different way of showing it, but underlying it's the same foundation. You know, it has the three, six, nine, you have the one, two, three, yeah. it's the same, yeah. same type of thing. I, uh, I have worked with rodent coils. I've probably wrapped like 10 of them. I, I feel that there are three things, like I was saying earlier. Uh, Marco <laughs> Roden has the nine. I feel that a nine comes from a three. And that's John's view is on things. And you know what he shared with me, it makes me feel more inclined to listen to some of the more simplistic things that he has shared with me. Hi, Josh. Hi. Hey, can you give us an idea about can you talk more about the correlation between sound and the geometry? Because I know that there, there is like these geometrical symbols are actually sounds, and and that I don't I don't remember which um, historian it was that developed the the um, the musical scale 
but he was able to demonstrate that these shapes are actually sounds. And um, so I was wondering if you could talk about that. So just the geometry? You just want to know about yeah. the... It's how, how I, I, I really would like to do uh, cymatic experiments in space where you could take a sphere of water and put it in space and run the sound through it. But essentially what's going on is the energy is passing through it and it, it conf it's conforming into these standing wave patterns. And if you have just like a, a car battery and a coil, a, a coil speaker, and you're tapping that car battery on and off, you're going to create different geometries in the water. So essentially, it's the vibrations per second that's going to be affecting the geometry of whatever uh, solution that you're putting in. Um, I mean, any, anything can be a solution. Of, so uh, the, the geometry in sound, I feel, plays a huge role in this. Um, the 432 work has been very um, something that has, cur has been my curiosity. Um, I've got a cousin that I, uh, he's a trumpet player at UNC, and I told him about this geometry and sound, and he broke into the school, retuned the piano to this 432, and they were playing with it for a whole week in this different geometry, and they were loving it, but then they changed it back because the, the professor was upset with it not being truly harmonious with the rest of the music. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've made some cymatic uh, experiments, and it's just, it's really, it's how the, the whole structure that's being affected organizes. So the little geometries in the big geometry, it's, it's a big fractal, it's uh, fractal reflections. Yeah, I got, a, I got a real simple question. Do you feel gravity's a wave? I feel gravity is the middle force. It's we're we're in a still area right now, so it's very calm, and I I feel that it's these m magnets that are flowing through each other all the time. Ed has an experiment where he can actually tell you which direction magnets are flowing up and down, not only just north and south. They're going up and down. So the like I was saying earlier, it's it's very much getting into Ed's book as an experimenter and seeing how the experiments are reflecting this energy and how it pushes, how it pulls. Um, I, I, I am in to the point now where I don't want to go into a lot of these terminologies and things. I have almost been brainwashed now into this three things. I am just looking for three things and when I see those three things I'm building based off of it. I've built about 16 magnet wheels. I do I do this stuff compulsively. Geometry, I'm just constantly going with it and I, you know I, I used to look at a lot of uh, part of you know the wavical, all, all the mainstream science stuff and I just I got alienated from it because of what the coral castle experiments are essentially describing. And that's one thing uh, Einstein talked about was the first man to understand a compass will understand everything. So the compass, I think, is still an underutilized tool. Uh, somebody recently showed me an experiment. You take that compass, you can prove that the positive polarity is facing the North Pole. So in fact, because opposites attract, it's actually attracting to a southern polarity in our North Pole. So. I mean, do we even know what pole our North Pole is? <laughs> so, it, it, it's, I, I don't know if it's a wave, but I, I know that magnetic energy is pervasive in everything, and I, I think that the geometry is really where this energy flux is happening. It's how things are structured. Do you think there's any relationship between uh, Ed's work and Grabenikov's? Yes, and I'm very happy you brought that up. Um, my half-sphere geometries is that cavernous structural fractal that's, and this is my opinion, that that's where the wave cancellation in those bug wings is happening. It's, yeah, that, it's that's, a, that's kind of where I was at as well. Uh, I, I mean, years ago when I was, um, you know, I, I, was lear I was reading an article about Lexus and using noise canceling technology to get rid of wind noise in their vehicles. And, uh, and as a musician, I recorded a handful of albums enough times to know that 
when you have conflicting frequencies, you know, phases that you lose instruments. And so you happen to record six guitars and you turn a couple up and you lose some and you don't really know why. And then you start switching it back and then you come back. And uh, just the same way those, those waveforms, whenever they're completely reverse uh, polarly, 180 degrees out of phase, that they'll cancel completely. And Lexus was doing the same thing in their vehicles. And, um, and Gurbinikov, uh, he also, I mean, I don't think it's a huge, huge secret that it was mostly based off Beatles, his work. And uh, I find that it's kind of, might be a coincidence that Ed Lederskalen says that he understood the secret of the Egyptians and in a lot of Egyptian art, you find the scarab. Exactly, you also find bees. Um, I, I agree with that wave cancellation because what I'm doing with this geometry, if I drew this geometry instead of projecting it on this half sphere, if I did it onto two dimensional plane, it wouldn't look like that at all. And I did this in a CAD program and was able to project it out. And when you actually take this two dimensional template and project it, it will show you this flower of life on the, the membrane of a sphere. Um, but it's through wave cancellation. There's, you know, I could do it in so many different ways, but essentially, like the one on the right, you see how those two are coming together? It's a, it's a wave cancellation. It's, that's what I see in geometry. I'm looking at the edge. I'm, I'm not essentially looking at the shape itself. I'm looking at the edge detail, that middle. It's, it's the middle force. There's you know, the inside of the geometry, the outside of the geometry, but it's the line that is that middle. It's defining the thing. A frequency of gravity is, then it would be fairly easy to use the, the uh, polar opposite or the phase shifted. Uh, and in music, it's a minor sixth. So you take a note and then you get a minor sixth and you lose both and cancel. Uh, in which music scale is in the audible range. And then, of course, you know, I've got already tested the audible range and gravity is definitely not there. Uh, if gravity is a wave, which uh, I, I, I tend to believe that it is. So, uh, and whenever I understood, you know, because I've, <laughs> my wife got upset when I started bringing Beatles home. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, I was even purchasing, you know, ones up, little kits where the people would put the pins in them and running frequencies through wings and, uh, you know, dark field microscopes, basically trying to reproduce a lot of that. But I, I think that that possibly could be the key is understanding where if what the frequency is of gravity, and then just the same way in music, which is a further scale down. Well, I, I want to put this out there. I, I've seen the heart, uh, acoustical levitation experiments and stuff. I, I don't believe that Ed was doing it that way. There's actually an old video of Ed lifting these stones and rolling them on big blocks. It's really heatedly debated. I'm not entirely sure he was levitating these things. Like I, I think it's almost mystified, but. From listening to John DePew, this this science is very simplistic, real. It it is ground shattering, but essentially it's the three things of nature. So we're here in the neutral plane right now. We're still we can lie down. That's a good observation with gravity. But if you look out into space, things are hurling, you know, churning up, and things are constantly moving. So we're kind of in that still neutral life space. He he is so complex but so simple of a person and that's why I'm here giving honor to him, to Tesla, to Ed Lee Scallon. I think that we really haven't made a real mockery of terminology and we're getting lost in our ideas with each other. I think we need to go back to a basic understanding geometry. Geometry and experiments just repeatability. I, I, I don't always like defining things. I like to see how it looks and then I try and engineer and build something off of it. I mean every wheel that I build nowadays works the first time I turn it on. These principles that Ed talked about in magnetic current are so expressive and so true in their nature. Um, it's, it's, it's really saddening that we haven't had the respect to Ed. It's you know, we, we have a lot of respect to Tesla, but people really still like to ignore Ed or say that, you know, it was just a guy moving stones on a balance point like in Michigan. 
you know, there's something different to it. I'm, I'm telling you, there's something special going on with Ed. And, and, and just a little piece, you can download all of Ed's books for free off etherforce.com. They have key chess. Just awesome. go download all of it for free and then read it for yourself. Do the experiments. They're simple. That's exactly right. Ed said send a dollar if you want to do the experiments. Otherwise, <laughs> just keep going. Can you, since you have some time here, can you cover a little bit of what Ed said, why he didn't believe in electrons and all that, that he just thought everything was I little mag like magnetic particles in there, you know, how he talked? Yeah, he, he calls them the North and South Pole little particles, how they move around and stuff. Um, oh, you were talking about the electron. Yeah. Um, he, he said that it was only half of the equation. So the engineers were looking at one side of the spectrum, and the physicists were looking at the other side. And if they came together, then maybe we could build something really special. An experiment to show something anomalous about the electron You've got a diode. A diode is a little glass tube that the electrons supposedly flow one direction or the other. Well, those electrons can't escape the glass. They're, you know, they're condensed in there. They're going through. Well, in a CRT monitor, you've got the electrons going through, and they're doing the same thing. But you have a magnet on the outside of that CRT monitor affecting inside of that glass. So I actually wrote a, a paper about this kind of anomaly of things passing through other things, and it's called magnetic viscosity. And kind of my view on it is that, like on a, a wet shirt, or a, a shirt, you can pour water through and it'll drip right through it. If you take a helium-2 superfluid, um, it's you know near zero Kelvin, you dip a beaker into it and you pull that beaker out, that fluid will drip right through this solution. So magnetic viscosity is trying to say that the magnetism is in the glass, also in the vacuum that is supposedly empty. It, it's all pervasive in that structure. So um, I think the electron is only half of the equation. How much time do I got? You, it is um, 3.02, you've got at least almost 15 minutes. Whatever feels awesome to you, we'd love to hear it. Let's see what I got here. Your artwork's awesome. Cool. What did you draw that in the one, that neat one that we were talking about in the lower left that was just Mine's before? The bottom left, it's, it's acrylics. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's weird being up here presenting, and I, I, I felt like I kind of rushed through it, because there really is too much to go into, and a, a starting place for me was the, the sundial. The sundial for Ed was just showing that he knew where we were going in space, and I think where we know where we're going, we can understand from there that the geometry of things is dictated by the flow of things, like in a riverbed. All right, let's see. Ed just, he, he came to America from Latvia and he, he, he built the castle actually in one location and moved the thing at one point. Um, it's, Um, the, he said the energy patterns weren't right. He said something wasn't right, so he moved it, and he had even better energy patterns going on. Do you know what it was? I'll tell you what it was if you don't know. He moved to a black wall plane, a natural earth occurring black wall plane. Okay. And that allowed him to have a lot of, you know, you talk about the neutral points. Mm -hmm. I think it gave him more of a balance point to play with, because he's right. He, from what we found out, it was like a naturally occurring black wall plane, just geophysically. Well, there's actually a report of him walking around in Canada looking uh, for a spot. So he may have been wandering the eastern seaboard for a long time when he came here as an immigrant. But there, there really is a lot of 
holes in this story. There's a lot of myth going on too with this, and that's kind of why I emphasize reading his book because it's his handwriting, it's his experiments. And just like Tesla, um, I, I try not to read too much of other people's work on Tesla. I try to read his own handwriting and learn from him himself. Um, really, this, this geometry of the 345, it's, it is three things. It's connected to the, the law of the squares. And this law of the squares, you can, you can check it out with uh, Searle technology. They're, it's a Rubik's Cube, and this information is just constantly happening all at the same time. And, ah, gosh. Um, I wanted to say thanks to uh, Fernando Vosa, because he's the one that really started encouraging me with my artwork and getting me really going with a lot of this. And the, the blacklight artwork is what he taught me to use. And it, it's just these different mediums that we're going to be able to layer into our technologies. And a renaissance is not just art, it's engineering, it's architecture. And there's a real move happening for all of this. And I, that's why I think Ed is kind of this, this leading figure, because he's got energy and he's also got the artwork going on. So. Um, Ed who? <laughs> Ed Leeds Gallen. Thank you. I wasn't here earlier. How do you spell the last name? I believe it's L E E D S K A L N I N. Hey, hey, did good. I, I had endless pictures, and somehow this hour went by a lot quicker. <laughs> and is it is it true that Ed Lee Scallon was was uh, a Mason? Um, he learned supposedly from his grandfather stone masonry work in Latvia. Um, I'm not sure if he was involved with any Masonic lodges here in the United States, but his symbol is in Masonic temples, and it's it's in all walks of life. I have seen it in every culture, and it it is so incredible to me that we are kind of putting this energy form out there. And we may not even fully understand it, but we're doing it intuitively. And I think we do it in our architecture, big time.